other cancers coming up. So next I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ryan Jensen, Assistant Professor of Therapeutic Radiology. I think everybody here knows uh, something about BRCA2 and how it's a risk factor for breast cancer. Some of you may even know that it's a risk factor for pancreatic cancer, but many of us do not know how it actually works and how it affects the DNA. This is an area of research of Dr. Jensen who received his PhD at Yale uh, which is focused on DNA double strand break repair in respo uh, response in mammalian cells. Uh, he currently is investing, investigating the role of BRCA2 in these double stranded break responses as well as its role in another mechanism of DNA repair called homologous recombination. So he's going to discuss the role of BRCA2 in DNA repair today. Welcome, Dr. Jensen. Thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk about uh, BRCA2, as Howard mentioned. So, oh, first I have nothing to, uh, no commercial interests to disclose, uh, except that some figures will contain biochemistry. So DNA damage unfortunately happens, and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, there are many forms, uh, some forms we can avoid, such as ultraviolet light from the sun, or God forbid, you know, you're getting your uh, winter tan. And of course, we use uh, radiation and chemotherapy drugs to treat cancer patients. Um, some of uh, endogenous damage uh, we can't control. Um, we can't control, such as oxygen we have to breathe, uh, which can result in free radical damage. Um, tasty charbroiled treats from the carts, uh, which also can result uh, in DNA damage. And the problem is, if we have faulty repair, our DNA repair enzymes are not working correctly. Uh, this can result in the accumulation of mutations, and as we all know, uh, once you get the right set of mutations uh, in a combination of genes, this can eventually result uh, in cancer. So luckily we have uh, a team of quality control inspectors that react to specific types of uh, DNA damage, and what I'm mostly interested in uh, are double strand breaks, which are repaired in mammalian cells by two main pathways. Uh, either homologous recombination or non-homologous injoining. And today I'm going to primarily talk about uh, homologous recombination, which is the pathway that BRCA2 is involved in. So this, this slide is pretty self-explanatory, and it's no surprise to this audience that mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 result in uh, increased breast and ovarian cancer. Um, so what you might not know is that in BRCA2 uh, mutant cells, so First of all, the knockout mouse uh, is early embryonic lethal. Uh, humans who carry a BRCA2 mutation are heterozygous. However, in the tumors, uh, they are BRCA2 null, so they've lost the wild type allele. Um, there is one instance uh, in Fanconi anemia uh, where you might have seen the talk uh, by Alan DeAndrea who discovered uh, that this one FANC gene, FANC D1, is actually the BRCA2 gene. And in those cases, those patients are actually compound uh, heterozygous, so they have two different mutations uh, in each BRCA2 allele. But these patients are very sick and, and usually come down with cancer at, at a very early age. Now, unfortunately, the mouse model, at least the, the mouse uh, heterozygote, um, is not a good model for us because there's no uh, tumor pre predisposition. So if we can isolate uh, BRCA2 mutant cells from tumors and grow them in culture, which can sometimes be difficult, uh, these cells are chromosomally unstable. Uh, they're highly sensitive to cross-linking agents uh, like mitomycin C and cisplatin. Uh, they show a decrease in homology-directed repair of double-strand breaks, and they show a reduction in uh, RAD51 foci in response to ionized radiation. So how does the BRCA2 disease progress? So if you are a carrier uh, of a mutant BRCA2 allele, um, and you eventually uh, lose the wild-type allele, uh, these cells are essentially null for BRCA2. And in most cases, these cells probably die. They probably arrest and are culled out. However, in the presence of uh, potentially additional mutations, such as loss of tumor suppressor genes like p53, uh, you accumulate more mutations, you'll become genomically unstable, and eventually this results uh, in a tumor uh, where both BRCA2 alleles are lost. So what do we know about BRCA2 so far? So we know BRCA2 binds to RAD51, and we know that RAD51 is a central player in homologous recombination. 
We know that BRCA2 is a caretaker of genome integrity. We know this from the genomic instability that we see in BRCA2 mutant cells. So our hypothesis is that BRCA2 promotes homologous recombination by bringing RAD51 to the site of a resected DNA double-strand break and facilitating, facilitating nuclear protein uh, filament formation, um, as shown in this model here. So if we have a double-strand break, uh, this gets uh, resected um, by nucleases, uh, resulting um, in this uh, single-stranded DNA tail. This is immediately coded, coded by the RPA protein. And then we think the BRCA2, along with its RAD51 cargo, comes to the junction between double-strand and single-strand DNA and then loads that RAD51 as a nuclear protein filament onto the single-strand DNA, thus displacing the RPA. And then the filament can then be formed and extended and then perform uh, the homology search in a uh, duplex uh, donor DNA template. So this is what the BRCA2 protein looks like. It's a big, uh, big cDNA, it's a big protein. So I just want to draw your attention to, to two main modules of the protein. In the middle, we have these eight BRC repeats which uh, have been found to bind to RAD51. And then also this carboxy terminus where a crystal structure was actually solved. And in this carboxy terminus, we find uh, two DNA binding domains. Um, one in this OB2, OB3 region, which binds single-strand DNA, and this three helix bundle at the tip of this tower domain, which can bind to uh, double-strand DNA. So I just wanted to mention, so this imparts two functions of BRCA2. One, the ability to bind RAD51, and then the other to deliver it to the DNA by binding uh, to a DNA junction. So as I said, the DNA damage response network uh, is complex, and, and when DNA damage occurs in the cell, they, they basically make a call on the 911, and if the operator is on duty, you get this massive cascade of events taking place, uh, including cell cycle arrest to allow time for repair. We have chromatin remodeling uh, enzymes that establish a perimeter, and then proteins detect the specific type of damage, and then repair-specific enzyme complexes come and to physically repair this damage. So what we wanted to do was utilize biochemistry uh, to focus in on the key components that we were interested in, in this case, BRCA2 and, and RAD51. So BRCA2 was cloned uh, about 15 years ago, so why hasn't anyone purified it yet? So for one reason is it's really big. As I mentioned, it's about 400 kilodaltons, and not only is it big, but it's also a very fragile protein. So if you look at it the wrong way, it degrades, it's unstable, it doesn't like to be overexpressed, uh, it doesn't like to be separated from its protein friends in the cell, so this makes the purification very difficult. So how do you purify it? Well, like any good biochemist, you move your bench into the cold room and you start trying things. It's a very empirical process. Um, I think this, this is a great slide for grad students and postdocs because I think this is the way we feel our research is usually going. So after spending about four years uh, in the cold room, I, I tried to stay motivated and, and tried to remember you know, what great scientists always said, if you just spend enough time, uh, eventually good things will start to happen. But of course, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, what if I'm going down the wrong path and this, I'm just being too stubborn and nothing's ever going to happen? But eventually, um, after about four years, I finally went back uh, to human cells and actually tagged it with a protein tag uh, called MBP, or maltose binding protein, which had worked uh, pretty well previously, and just transfected this uh, into human uh, embryonic kidney cells, or 293T cells, uh, which in my experience um, tend to express recombinant cDNAs very well and transfect very well, so it seemed like a good cell system to go, to go into for this. Um, so this is one of the first Westerns uh, where I had actually um, got this massive overexpression, which you can see here in this Western blot. So that far lane there is the yield I got from transfecting uh, a 10 centimeter plate. So for, for biochemistry, uh, this was kind of embarrassing because you need a lot more protein if you're actually going to do any experiments. Um, so this is one of the few good things that I ever wrote down in my lab notebook, and this is one of my all-time favorite lab pages. So I actually wrote down, let's try adding another MBP tag, you know, sort of like a 6x hiss. Let's just add another MBP. The protein's already huge. What's another 40 kilodaltons? And so I did this, and my expression actually went up, and my yield went up. Still, this is a Western blot, so not enough protein to do any good biochemistry, but I thought, well, if I scale this up enough, maybe I'll get enough protein. And so that's what I did. And so I transfected about 20 plates of these 293T cells, took them into the cold room, did this for about a year, and eventually uh, I got enough protein to see uh, the full-length BRCA2 on a Kamasi stain gel, which is uh, shown here. So again, this is one of, another one of my all-time uh, favorite gel slices. 
So there were two keys to success. One was um, expressing this protein in human cells, which is good because then you have post-translational modifications, uh, you have solubility, and, um, and increased the, the final yield of the protein in my case. So I also wanted to verify that this 2XMBP tag did not interfere with the function of the protein. So using my genetics background, I stably transfected it into BRCA2 mutant cells, which you can see here in pink are very sensitive to mitomycin C. However, when I stably complemented them with the 2XMBP BRCA2, uh, it sh they showed levels of resistance to mitomycin C pretty similar to the V79 or, or wild type parental cell line. So this was good, so I didn't actually cleave the tag. And, and now we had a lot of questions uh, with the purified protein that we wanted to address, um, such as how many RAD51s are bound to BRCA2, and, and is there a DNA substrate uh, specificity? So just to review the players for you, so we purified all these proteins. So as I mentioned before, RAD51 is the central player in homologous recombination. The problem with RAD51 is that it likes to bind both single-strand DNA and double-strand DNA and can't make up its mind. Whereas RPA has a strict specificity uh, for single-strand DNA. And then our model was that bracket 2 should bind uh, to a 3' prime tail substrate or a junction, where it can then load RAD51 onto the single-strand DNA. So first we took our purified bracket 2 and just to confirm that the protein was properly folded, we incubated it with uh, RAD51, took advantage of this MBP tag, and bound it to amylose beads, washed the beads, and then eluded the protein off. And we were happy to see that, indeed, it could bind uh, to human RAD51. It could also bind uh, to yeast RAD51, which is not too surprising, as, as the proteins are highly homologous. Uh, we saw no binding to uh, E. coli SSB, which is the ortholog of RPA and E. coli, and just a smidgen of binding to uh, RECA, the RAD51 ortholog in E. coli. So next, we wanted to ask the question, how many RAD51s can actually bind to the full-length bracket 2? And in this case, we took a fixed amount of the full-length BRCA2 and then titrated in increasing amounts of RAD51. And in this experiment, we found both uh, high and low affinity sites uh, using the saturation binding curve analysis. And we also found that the full-length BRCA2 saturates at about six RAD51s. Um, so some of these BRC uh, repeats are actually not occupied uh, by RAD51. Next, we wanted to look at uh, DNA binding specificity, and again, uh, our model was that uh, this three prime tailed substrate should be the primary uh, uh, substrate, and BRCA2 could indeed uh, bind it by shown by these uh, gel shift assays, but it could also bind single strand DNA, a five prime tail, and to a lesser extent, uh, a double strand DNA, which is quantitated uh, down here. So next, uh, we wanted to measure homologous recombination in vitro. And so to do this, we use uh, the DNA strand exchange assay, uh, which was really pioneered by our own Charles Radding and Patrick Sung. And, and in my uh, setup, what I used were uh, two oligonucleotides uh, that I annealed together to create this three prime uh, tail DNA substrate, which results in 125 nucleotide overhang and 42 base pairs of uh, double strand DNA. To this, I then incubate with uh, purified RAD51, and then we add a radio-labeled uh, duplex donor, where the pairing strand here below is radio-labeled to P32, and is homologous to the end of this uh, single-strand DNA. And if you get strand exchange, and this RAD51 filament invades and displaces the, the cold oligo, you end up with this product uh, on the gel, which is uh, shown here. So at the bottom, we have the uh, radio-labeled double-strand DNA, and at the top of the gel here, we have the uh, product. And one thing you'll notice is there's, there's an optimum for RAD51. So this is based on the site size of RAD51 binding to three nucleotides. Um, and once you saturate the DNA lattice and start to add excess RAD51, it can actually partition onto this double-strand DNA. And that's actually inhib inhibitory for strand exchange. And so you, you might be thinking, well, it looks like RAD51 can do this pretty well on its own. Uh, so what's the point of having um, BRCA2 around? Well, going back to my genetics background, I try to mimic uh, biochemically what's going on in vivo. So in in vivo, if RPA is actually bound to that single-strand DNA first, it actually blocks RAD51 uh, from loading onto that single-strand DNA. So to accomplish this experiment, I incub pre-incubated that uh, three-prime tail with uh, RPA, increasing amounts of RPA shown here, and this effectively blocks uh, RAD51-mediated uh, strand exchange. So now the question was, could BRCA2 overcome this RPA blockade? And so this was the big question. So here we have a strand exchange assay gel. 
First lane is no protein. Second lane is RAD51 alone. We then block RAD51 strand exchange with the RPA first. And here I've titrated in increasing amounts of RAD51, or sorry, BRCA2, and showed that uh, this could indeed stimulate recombination uh, in the presence of RPA. And then I went on to show, uh, to do all the controls, including that this uh, strand exchange is ATP dependent, RAD51 dependent, and homology dependent. So next I wanted to see if BRCA2 had a DNA substrate preference uh, in strand exchange. So if you remember from our model, we think that BRCA2 loads RAD51 uh, specifically onto this uh, three prime tail DNA substrate. Indeed, it can do this. Um, however, we also saw stimulation uh, on this five prime tail DNA substrate, uh, which was unexpected. And experiments have a way of sometimes not showing you the results that you want. Um, However, uh, this is what we have to deal with. And we also found uh, that it could also bind and simulate uh, single-strand DNA, as shown uh, here on the right. So next, we wanted to form another type of challenge experiment, where we actually incubated uh, double-strand DNA and the tail DNA together first, and then added the RAD51. And you can see under these conditions, uh, there's no uh, stimulation of strand exchange with RAD51 alone. However, if we add BRCA2, either in the absence or presence of RPA, uh, we see stimulation. And in a similar experiment, if you remember the first RAD51 strand exchange assay, uh, in the presence of excess RAD51, we see an inhibition, and BRCA2 can also overcome uh, this scenario. So our model at this point is that BRCA2 um, enforces binding of RAD51 to single-strand DNA and keeps it off the double-strand DNA. Next, to get more mechanistic insight uh, into BRCA2, we had known previously uh, by a postdoc in the lab, or a Carrera, who'd shown that the BRC4 repeat by itself can actually inhibit the ATP as activity of RAD51. And I should tell you that this nucleoprotein filament that RAD51 forms is actually stabilized by ATP. And once that ATP gets hydrolyzed to ADP, the RAD51 then dissociates um, off the DNA and, and the filament starts to, di to dis disassemble. So we also showed this uh, same effect with the, the full length of BRCA2 and that BRCA2 can inhibit this ATP as activity of, of RAD51 and thus stabilize the RAD51 filament. So to conclude this part, we found that functional active full length BRCA2 could be purified from human cells we found that it could stimulate uh, homologous recombination in three mutually reinforcing ways. Um, it can enforce binding of RAD51 to single-strand DNA and limit binding to double-strand DNA. It could overcome this RPA inhibition, and it could inhibit the ATPA's activity of RAD51, uh, maintaining the active form of the filament. And also that a single-strand, double-strand DNA junction is the preferred substrate uh, for BRCA2 in these DNA strand exchange reactions. So just to show you a cartoon, to summarize uh, some of this data, if we have a, uh, a double-strand break, that break is then uh, resected by nucleases to reveal these three prime single-strand DNA tails. These tails are immediately coded, coded by the RPA protein. And then RAD51, or BRCA2, comes in with its RAD51 cargo, binds to this junction, loads the RAD51, uh, displaces the RPA, keeps it off the double-strand DNA inhibits the ATP's activity of RAD51, maintaining this uh, filament stability. And then this RAD51 single-strand DNA can invade a duplex template and search for homology. And then through a complex uh, set of, inter of reactions, we end up with a repaired chromosome. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and talk about some of the single molecule analysis uh, that we've been doing. So I've been working with Chris uh, Dombrowski, a postdoc in the Kwasikowski lab for about the past three years to set up a system where we can look at single molecules of BRCA2 loading RAD51 onto single molecules of, of DNA. So just to give you a schematic of how uh, our single molecule setup works, we have an inverted uh, fluorescent microscope here onto which we uh, put onto the stage a flow cell where we can then uh, pump and flow buffer containing proteins, uh, DNA, different types of buffer, ATP, and then we have an infrared laser that apps, acts as a uh, optical trap, which we can then trap a one micron uh, polystyrene bead that we coat with streptavidin. And then to this bead, we can capture biotinylated uh, lambda DNA, which is about 48 KB. We then can visualize this DNA using uh, YoYo-1 uh, fluorophore. 
which I should mention also non-specifically binds to the bead, so you can always visualize the bead in your optical trap, and this is shown here. So this is a single piece of DNA with the bead here on the left. This is what a flow cell looks like. So this is a four-channel flow cell where we're just pumping through uh, food coloring dye just to show you the various uh, channels. And then here's what a flow cell looks um, on the actual instrument. So you can see here, here's the, the channels, or here's the tubes going into the channels, and here's the outlet, which brings everything into the waste after your experiment's done. So what Chris and I wanted to do was see if we could actually watch in real time uh, BRCA2 loading RAD51 uh, onto, this, uh, onto a DNA substrate, onto a resected double-strand break. So this was quite tricky, um, and again, took many years. So what we had to uh, basically mimic was this resected double-strand break. And the problem with single molecule is you have this single-strand DNA, it tends to aggregate or ball up. And so what Chris did was he actually split the IR beam and created a system where we could capture two beads, so we could capture two ends of the DNA, essentially creating this, this DNA dumbbell. And just to show you um, what a typical single molecule experiment looks like, here we're in the channel where we're capturing the two beads and the two optical traps. We're then moving the stage into the channel with the yo-yo one stained DNA. And there we've trapped a single DNA molecule. We then have a joystick, uh, actually a Sony PlayStation controller in this case, where we can move the two beads around in the optical trap. And we're just wiggling this DNA. As I told you, it was biotinylated, and, we're, and the, the bead is streptavid encoded. So once we've attached it, Chris is then going to pull it out of that trap to show that the bead is indeed attached to the DNA. And we can then manipulate and then move this bead DNA complex into various channels with various proteins, ATP, etc. So the next trick was to generate this single-strand DNA region flanked by the double-strand DNA. Uh, and this was done by a postdoc in the lab, Jody Plank. So he used this uh, lambda integrase to actually integrate about 8,000 bases of single-strand DNA flanked by uh, the double-strand DNA on either side. And this is just verification uh, that this substrate was created. So here's a DNA dumbbell. We're actually going to pull on it and stretch it out. And the single-strand DNA region is actually uh, invisible because the yo-yo one uh, has a much lower affinity for, for single-strand DNA. So there's the gap right there. So the first thing we wanted to do as we were assembling these experiments is to see if BRCA2 could indeed bind uh, this DNA substrate. So uh, we used an antibody approach where we had a fluorophore conjugated to a secondary antibody to visualize uh, BRCA2 on this DNA. And indeed, we could see it. So if you look at this spot right here, that's actually where the single-strand DNA gap is. Uh, so this is just BRCA2 incubated with the DNA alone. Next, we wanted to see if BRCA2 could bind in the presence of RPA. So if we coded this single-strand DNA region with RPA, could we still see binding of BRCA2? And indeed, uh, we could. So in this case, we see two spots of BRCA2 here, and actually, actually another spot of BRCA2 on the end of this DNA, which actually contains a little bit of single-strand DNA. Next, we wanted to see if we could visualize RAD51 filament formation. So we had done this on lambda double-strand DNA, but we had never done it on this gap substrate. So in this case, we capture uh, a one-ended DNA bead molecule with pre-coded with RPA, which in this case is invisible. Uh, it's not fluorescently conjugated. And then we dip it into this channel with fluorescent RAD51, and then we look to see if a RAD51 filament is formed. And that's exactly what we saw. So this is the RAD51 filament forming as, uh, as we dip this molecule into the fluorescent RAD51 channel. And again, you can see the RPA, which is invisible in this case, uh, bound to that single-strand DNA, which is the gap. You might also notice that the RAD51 filament is extended. So this was a known property that the RAD51 filaments are actually extended about 150% uh, when they are completely coating uh, the DNA. So next, we wanted to add in our BRCA2. So in this case, we have, in addition to the fluorescent RAD51, uh, we have our BRCA2 protein in this channel, and then we bring it down into the observation channel. And the idea here was, could we actually see visualization of filling in of this gap? So the RAD51 can't get onto this because the RPA is, is there first. And so we wanted to see, well, can BRCA2 facilitate this reaction? Indeed, so this is still preliminary. So these results uh, actually are only from a couple weeks ago. but it appears that uh, BRCA2 is filling in this gap, and it's doing it very quickly. So if you look at the red spot here, this is where the gap is. And this is an actual uh, movie here showing you 
uh, that this, the RAD51 filament in green here is filling in uh, this gap. But at this point, we still need to uh, generate some more movies to generate um, significant statistics. But it, it looks like bracket 2 is performing the function that, that we were hoping for. And just finally, we, we wanted to go back and look at uh, double-strand DNA, because uh, as I mentioned, BRCA2 can bind to double-strand DNA, however, much, with a much lower affinity than to um, single-strand DNA. And Chris noticed some interesting things that, that you could only really see using a uh, single molecule. And that's that every time he visualized BRCA2 on double-strand DNA, he sort of noticed that the BRCA2 was moving. And, and being a physicist, he was asking me, well, is BRCA2 a translocase? And I said, well, not that I know of. Um, and so he showed me some of these molecules. Uh, that actually appear to be sliding uh, along uh, the double-strand DNA. So here's another movie here, where you can see he's captured actually two, so this is actually a dual molecule movie. You can see the bracket 2 spot here appears to be moving. And this is a chymograph plot showing uh, the bracket 2 sort of sliding along the DNA. Although this is, I have to say there's a caveat, this is in the presence of flow, so that, that could be an artifact of, of the flow in, in, the, in the channel. So we have a lot of questions that we want to ask using single molecule, including uh, can BRCA2 remain, at, does it remain at the site of loading? Uh, does it load RAD51 and then leave? Do multiple BRCA2s bring RAD51 to load along the DNA? Um, is it excluded from preformed filaments? Um, does it slide along double-strand DNA until a junction is encountered? And these are all questions we can address uh, using single molecule analysis. So just real quickly, I just wanted to mention, so it's not all about playing video games, so what really matters is, is what does this all mean in terms of cancer, uh, and how do tumor-associated mutations in BRCA2 disrupt function? So the problem is when you sequence a patient and they have um, a point mutation or a missense mutation where it's not really clear what impact that has on the BRCA2 protein. Is it just a polymorphism or is it actually uh, deleterious uh, to the person and give them an increased risk of cancer? So the question really is with these missense mutations, how can we distinguish um, sort of these innocuous polymorphisms from the genetic mutations. So if Snooki goes in, you know, and gets her BRCA2 gene sequenced, and it's a clear truncation, BRCA2 can't get into the nucleus, it can't do its job, so that's a very easy call. That's, that's going to give you a high risk of cancer. However, if Snooki has one of these missense mutations, and they're very rare, and there's not enough clinical data to understand it, it's very hard to predict, predict cancer risk, and this, this could be very upsetting, and we don't want to make Snooki upset. So we're trying to incorporate these missense mutations into our purified BRCA2 and see if we can characterize them uh, biochemically. And these are called variants of unknown significance. So one particular variant that we've gone after uh, is this R3052W mutation, um, which is located right at the interface between OB folds 2 and 3. Um, and we've been working with um, Amitabh Namankar in the lab, uh, in uh, the Kowalczykowski lab. And he actually purified this uh, mutation that we created. And uh, as you can see, it's very similar to the wild type protein. And just to give you an idea, based on the crystal structure of where this mutation is, as I said, it's based right between the OB folds uh, two and three, which <coughs> would predict a severe disruption of, of this interface, and also could possibly interfere with binding to uh, the single strand DNA substrate. But we found that this mutant could indeed bind uh, RAD51, which is not surprising because this region um, is actually outside the RAD51 binding module. However, we started to get ne nervous and, and lose some of our faith in biochemistry because actually the mutant not only could it bind DNA, but it actually binds DNA better than the wild type. Um, so we were getting a little bit nervous. And we had already had this result where we knew that this mutant could not complement uh, uh, BRCA2 mutant cells. So these are uh, BRCA2 mutant cells complemented with the wild type gene, and these are complemented with the R3052 double mutant. However, our faith was restored because we then performed the DNA strand exchange assay, and we found that uh, unlike the wild type protein, uh, this variant actually could not perform uh, DNA strand exchange. So there's some problem with uh, actually facilitating this reaction, um, whether it's loading RAD51 or it can't let go of the DNA, we're, we're not clear at this time, but this is something we're actively pursuing. So we plan to go on a lot of, to go after a lot of these BRCA2 sequence variants in two ways, using both our uh, biochemistry and our in vivo uh, genetics and, and cell biology approaches. And hopefully we can address a lot of these questions pertaining to cancer-associated mutations and whether we can predict risk biochemically um, and get some further mechanistic insight into how BRCA2 works. 
So finally, I'd just like to thank uh, my lab, uh, Gori and Anirudh, uh, and um, our collaborators in the Kwasikowski Lab, UC Davis, Chris Dombrowski, uh, Jody Plank, Ora Carrera, and Amitabh uh, Namankar. And I'd always like to uh, thank our uh, supporters of our research. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Ryan. That was an